time to talk about the um, community outreach roundtables and what we learned gleaned from that first one. And I, you know, um, for those members who were there last night, feel free to also talk about um, your experiences with that as well. Just a second. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Uh, can you hear me okay, or is this yes, you can. how it goes? A little bit better. The whole thing like this. Okay. Um, so I'm Stephanie Randolph, I'm the Communications Manager for the State Board, and today I've got a couple of different things to talk to you about. Um, so we're going to talk about the Strategic Plan Dashboard and some highlights from the Executive Summary that's in your packet. Um, we'll also talk about um, some outreach that we've done, that we've been doing in the last few months um, on behalf of the Board and some of the outreach that the Board itself has been doing. Um, so, and then at the very end, we should have plenty of time for you all to talk about the Diverse Communities Roundtable. So for the strategic plan dashboard, um, first of all, um, we've got several topics throughout the presentation today and tomorrow um, where uh, staff members will be talking about different items that actually touch on different sections of the strategic plan. Um, so Andrew and Parker will be talking about, um, in their data slides, they'll be talking about gap closure. Um, budget and legislative, that will talk about, that's Jack and Julia, they'll be discussing Board's legislative priorities, and the 24 credit diploma implementation by Linda obviously is, is really critical to career and college readiness. Um, and Jack has several BEA wa waivers to talk about with you for you all to vote on. Uh, so some highlights from the executive summary. Um, let me move forward here. So you all are familiar with the dashboard. Um, this shows a little bit of progress. Um, we use this throughout the timeline for the strategic plan, um, which is 2015 to 2018. Um, and this gives you a little bit of an update over last board meeting. Um, so first of all, for communications, um, we had a phenomenal uh, blog post uh, readership. We have the widely read letter to the legislature regarding the biology end of course, being removed the end of course from graduation requirements. Um, this was huge engagement. Um, we had 13 times our typical readership. Um, our Twitter stats were six times what we usually have. Um, and so we're looking at 35 original tweets where people either took it from the blog post or they retweeted what we had. 28 retweets um, and then 11 favorites. So that's, that's pretty good for, um, for our tweets stats. Um, and then on Facebook, a lot of teachers and family members actually shared this blog post. So that was huge. That was about 25 times what we normally see on Facebook. Um, so we also went to the um, Washington Achievement Awards, and Andrew and Parker did quite a bit of heavy lifting, both literal and figurative. <laughs> um, and it was a pretty great presentation, and we heard from a lot of schools how much they appreciate that opportunity and how much they appreciate the recognition and, and how much it means to them to come to the, to the event and, and receive the award. Um, we also um, worked with, let's see, I don't think I have a slide on it. One thing I don't have a slide on because it really didn't lend itself to a PowerPoint um, was the response that we got to the Seattle Times article um, from Parker's presentation on the advanced course seeking gaps. Um, Parker, this was his first, Parker, this was his first um, interview and with the media and it went very well. <laughs> um, good job. Uh, it went really well, um, and we had, and it, there were some interesting comments on the Seattle Times article, um, quite a bit of, like, pretty thought-provoking comments regarding, um, you know, making sure that all students have access to those sort of course-taking opportunities. Um, so, uh, final thing here, the Educational System Health webpage, which is based on the 5491 report, um, was, went live last week. Um, and it's, so it's been updated with 2014 data based on the Achievement Index. Um, we've had a, quite a few schools calling and asking for information on that, so it's been great to have that help. So after the Diverse Communities Forum last, at the last board meeting, um, we had opportunities for several school visits. Um, that one evening of outreach resulted in quite a bit of connections, um, positive connections with different schools and different educators in the community so we could go and visit schools in different areas of the state. So 
Um, then I went to several schools, and I know several of you have also gone to do school visits. Um, so we had two in Western Washington, one in Central Washington, and then also one in Eastern Washington, just south of Spokane. And the first one um, that was almost immediately after the North Communities Round Forum was Kids at Hope, and I, I think you probably all saw the video that, that Ben took of all the kids that were yelling, they are, we are kids at Hope. And then Bridgeport is in the middle of the state. Um, they have phenomenal statistics for um, dual credit course taking, um, and it seems like they were all they were all really happy to be able to show what they're doing there. And then Liberty High School is just south of um, Spokane. So we're continuing to do outreach, um, and uh, many of you all were at the community forum event last night. That was our um, best attendance for any community forum. We had 37 members of the public there. Um, and a lot of great conversation. Thank you all very much for attending and for engaging in those deep conversations with members of the public. They really appreciate it. Um, and there's also a, a piece on the local CBS TV station uh, last night at 11 o'clock. And as soon as I can get a clip, I'll share that with you all. So the, this was a, as far as um, the background, a very diverse um, background, many different perspectives. We had school administrators, we had teachers, we had parents, um, we had school nurses, um, several of the principals and assistant principals from the site visits that um, many board members participated in yesterday attended um, last night as well, and, and so it was really great for them. You know, they'd shown us kind of what their school could do, and they really wanted to have the opportunity so that was really great. We also had the, the Junior Achievement um, Group, which works with um, connecting students with members of the, uh, the business community. Um, we had several teachers who um, had very strong opinions about um, testing or assessments and, um, and how those really uh, show like how students are doing. Um, it was a pretty phenomenal turnout. So, um, oh, I've got things out of order a little bit here. So the Diverse Communities Roundtable, um, this is something that you all will have some time to talk about. I actually don't have a copy of the, um, the summary here, but um, I think I could probably steal my agenda, my packet over there that has it in it, so we'll just go grab that. So we have until 9.15 um, for discussion on the Diverse Communities Roundtable Summary, and I'm just here if you have any questions or would like any additional information. Um, so I want to point those members who had participated either in the morning or the summer or the summer of therapy um, on a couple levels. One, um, uh, just the experience itself. weren't actually invited, they just heard about it and came. Um, and just a lot of good input, um, talking about what they felt that kids um, within their community needed, um, both um, with some at the school level, but also from the policy level. So it was very, very important. Um, and so 
something that um, having just invited legislators to our community forums before and we didn't get the kind of participation, I think these two forums really show that um, inviting members of the community, um, parents, teachers, anyone who wants to come is really a way to outreach. So I thought we got valuable input. And I wanted to thank Stephanie and Parker for the great summary that they did from the, from the first forum. It was very, very informative. Parker really deserves credit for the summary. <laughs> formal, that is, if it becomes a normal part of the state board activities, we need to treat it that way because um, how you start it, how you end it, what the timing is, how much people can talk, uh, knowing how many state board members are going to be there is critical because we actually broke it out into tables and if we didn't have enough board members to go to each table, um, it, it, you know, it's 
starts to lower the quality. And uh, I would rather talk a little bit about how we keep this thing going and structure it. Uh, and what is the purpose of our discussion the next day, like maybe sharing what we learned with the board members that couldn't go? Because the, the discussion was very insightful of a number of people. Uh, it was also divisive. said and they were not corrected uh, by the time the rest of the people walked out. So you have misinformation going out. Um, so just some of the observations. I, I thought it was well worth the minute to my board members. Um, I had a couple of people at uh, the table I was at who actually had been at the uh, Spokane board meeting. Uh, one of them, uh, Orlando Sparks, is planning to start a charter. He's working through the state charter uh, because he's, he's very concerned about the support that uh, uh, the kids that are most in need get. And I thought he was uh, quite uh, thoughtful uh, and articulate in, in terms of how he's going about this. But that was part of the conversation at the table was charters, how do they fit in in this? The bigger part of the conversation, though, uh, I think we heard a little bit of it here, uh, and I think Judy uh, spoke to it to some degree, is how do we personalize the education? process for kids. Uh, how do we make it so that each child is handled according to his or her abilities? And it's a huge challenge, and I don't envy schools. The principal from, uh, was it Stevens Middle School, the one from Jordan yesterday? Is that the name of the middle school? Uh, Charlotte uh, Troxel, I believe. Uh, she made it clear, um, you know, or at least opposed to in the past, she, she made it clear that what they work with there with those kids is not just okay, the sixth grade teachers work on this, they make sure that the sixth grade teachers hand off in an appropriate fashion to the seventh grade teachers, this whole notion of every child by uh, name and need. And I thought that was very good to hear all that under some very challenging circumstances, and they certainly have concerns about, uh, specifically in the Pasco School District, about bonding capacity because they don't have the facilities for a lot of the things that are coming out, such as uh, early childhood, um, etc. Pro probably all day uh, kindergarten if they don't have that um, already. Uh, but I think the, the, the overall message there was you need to be able to personalize this for the kids. It's very challenging for us here to find the space to do this. And last but not least, yes, back got a whole bunch of, uh, you know, oh my God, you know, can, and I didn't just hear it at my table, how can you tie this test into a kid's uh, ability to graduate or not graduate from high school. And as Bob pointed out, and I tried to point out, we haven't set those threshold scores yet. We're going there. We understand that it's new. It's a transition period. All of those types of things. But these were community parents, uh, activists, and the uh, one principal who expressed those concerns. table that Judy and I uh, sat at, we had the two principals from the high school, from Pasco High School, um, and they, uh, I think the community, for me, the input that we heard at our table was contextualized by the tours that we went on yesterday, I think, and, and so I just want to talk about the quality of those and um, congratulate the Pasco School District for, I mean, they rolled out the red carpet, but um, beyond that, what we saw in those schools was and, um, you know, from a teacher's perspective, some of the things I saw, I saw, you know, you can put on the dog and pony show when the State Board of Education comes to town, but there's things that you can't fake. There's things that take years and years of meticulous, hard work, and we saw that at play yesterday. Um, you know, when, when stu students working on very higher level thinking tasks, and when they were asked, what are you doing and why are you doing it, responded with, Students that when we walked in the door looked you square in the eyes and gave you a nice, firm handshake. Um, that's training, you know, and um, and I just, I saw 
saw things that had been overtly paid attention to over a number of years, and it was across the, you know, it was in every school we went to. It wasn't just in one school. So I think the input that those two principals gave was contextualized for me by the, the excellence and the quality that I saw on our tours. And what they had to say <coughs> made me think again, and they were concerned about um, high school graduation tasks that were one size fits all. Um, you know, they at Pasco High School, they talked about their extended graduation uh, rate and that they actually set it up that way. And that when, and, and they were also concerned about the achievement index and the labels of failing um, because, you know, we benchmark these things at a particular chronological age or grade level and their students are often chronologically one or two years behind that because the goal is that end goal, which is for students to graduate and go on to a productive life. Um, and it doesn't fit, it, like systemically for their whole system, it doesn't fit the cut, cookie cutter that we have for the rest of the state in terms of the population they serve. So, and they spoke really eloquently to that, so. Thank you. I'd like to follow on with what Colin said. I think the school visits were extremely in action um, education for every child um, and then to be able to use that as the backdrop for our discussions and our policy making I think is critical and to understand what we do and how it impacts what's on the ground um, and what may sound doable in this room as it gets translated out into the real world may not be as um, easy um, or have the consequences that we intend or are hoping um, to transmit. And um, it wasn't just the teachers or the administrators, it was the students who um, we got the opportunity to interact with and see, and not only as Holly said, were they um, on task and um, very knowledgeable about what they were explaining it, um, not like they've been coached. The words were still teenager words or third grader words, but um, I, it brought home to me how much work is going on in schools every day and how much, we, how we have to keep working to get that information in. The things like labels of failing schools, even though we call them priority, that's not the community name. That's not how it gets translated. And um, we need to find ways beyond the achievement awards to highlight and recognize the good work that's going on and the growth that's happening. Um, and I hope that we can incorporate these visits in all the communities that we go to so that we can learn more and more about all the different ways that we're doing the education. Um, I just want to add that I was at the, uh, I wasn't at the one last night, but I was at the one uh, in Tacoma. But um, in listening to the folks that was at the event last night, I was struck thinking about how different um, the experience was because you had it connected to the school visit and you had subsequent teachers and various folks, administrators engaged in across um, dialogue. And in, and in Tacoma, it was very valuable, but it was very much um, community activist groups. It was, I'm sure it was a teacher or two in there, but, um, so it, it kind of back, it, I was thinking about what Bob was saying. Um, not that they all have to look alike, but I think thinking through how we can get, um, anytime you can get cross dialogue, I think is really critical when you can get, even if you get a couple of students there, but teachers, administrators, the community, community groups, and um, the group in Tacoma offered a lot of valuable insight, um, but we didn't have, um, and the but is not a negative, it's just, I feel, I'm like, darn it, I should, if Deborah and I should have came in earlier, I could try to make this event. But um, but I feel like I'm listening to you all in having the school part of it, which seems like it's a valuable thing um, to this conversation. So not that you can always do that perhaps, but thinking about how we want to structure who should be in the room and, and why, and then the other thing I think is critical, and my table I facilitated, um, 
to Bob's point, it was the time went by too fast. I mean, it was it's like, and then you get one or two people like me who enjoy talking, and um, you know, thirty minutes is gone. But but um, I think I spent too much time sort of saying what we do and what we don't do. And if there's a way um, to do that either up front or in pre materials or something, because a lot of people really don't know exactly what, where we have. They think we have some of the legislative duties that we don't. Um, so there's a, there's a level of level setting about what we do, about why we're doing this, and what we intend to get out of it. And um, you did a nice job, Madam Chair, at the beginning offering some of that. But I think thinking through how we want to structure it, what stuff needs to be given on prehand, what is attached, do we visit a school, do we visit a site, then do post, um, is, will be really critical. But it sounds like that was a, a pretty valuable model. As was Tacoma. Tacoma was valuable, but it was very much organized organizations. It was heavy organizations, which is not bad, but it was, it, it was just one side kind of. And so we were all singing to the choir. But to have various stakeholders um, seems like it is an equally important. Yeah, I just want to say appreciate both conversations very much and really honor all of you for structuring that into your work plan. Because uh, the, for me, the big theme that carried through both is parents feeling not heard, and that can be teachers and administrators feeling not heard in the policy making work. Um, and I mean, really across ethnicity, folks have a lot of common feeling in that way, mm -hmm. even with the achievement gap that we're so concerned about. And so there's a, a question I have about our role and opportunity in communicating this reform agenda, its likely trajectory, why it's bumpy right now, because it is terribly bumpy right now, and it's created a lot of fear. I mean, last night's context was very much about fear. What are the consequences going to be for our children, for our teachers, for our schools, for poor performance on a, a test? And, and that certainly is not the intention of that plan in any way. And so to see if we can take control of the message and listen to make adjustments so that it's improved for the children just seems very powerful. Yeah, that's awesome. um, just to follow on uh, the comment that Trey made, our first forum, the diverse forum, was specifically designed to look at and get input on the achievement gap. And so I think that's why, you know, to, um, uh, to a large extent, we invited those organizations and parents to, to talk to us about how can we do more to address that. And yesterday, I think it was just more general, I, and maybe Stephanie can clarify the difference in, in terms of who we invited, but resoundingly, we need to do more messaging, you know, to Janice's point, around the assessment, around the SBAC, and, and what's taking place with it, because there's a lot of fear and confusion. And we talked about that, but we, and OSPI, need to step out and try and communicate more about you know, where we are. We know we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but that's even saying that is important. I just, and then Kevin. Okay. <laughs> um, I had the opportunity to also um, be an interim here, go to a uh, community forum that was put together by another organization in Seattle. And it was really helpful to get a different format to Bob's point that maybe um, <coughs> still allowed for a lot of um, uh, community input and voice, but provided a little bit more structure in the sense of uh, trying to get ahead of some of the misinformation. And so they had in the very beginning an opportunity for those who were on a panel, who did a panel um, versus breaking out into tables. But the one I think really value added that approach was we talked about some of the, we were given questions ahead of time about the assessment, about the cut scores, about graduation requirements. And so we were able to help get ahead of some of the misinformation. And so we, our discussions were, about um, real, it, you know, issues that were real in the sense that they were not related to things that people thought were going to happen that weren't aren't really going to happen. And so I think that is a really good point. And I'm, you know, maybe we think about like how do we do some prepping, do a little bit of both, so people still feel heard, but that we're also pro doing a service in the sense that we're trying to provide the information that is is not. Mine was, 
My, mine was just purely clarification and, and Trey, who scary as this may be, my, my mind and his mind are sometimes running in the same zone. But, uh, uh, I think Trey, yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, but I was in the same place because my, my experience before under the nomenclature term, and I thought this happened in Tacoma, but I could be wrong, um, is that we had community forums, and that was a different set of animals that were showing up for that. And this intentional thing that was done that I didn't attend in Tacoma, as I think has been pointed out, was to reach out. So now it looks like maybe we're getting to a meld or to a new model. Is that what I'm, because I thought, did we, did we also have a community forum scheduled at that one or just that? Yeah, we did. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. So it's, it's just nomenclature and trying to turn it into what it's going to be. So at the March meeting, we had the Diverse Communities Outreach Roundtable, and then um, that was immediately uh, after the community forum. But it, a lot of the people who attended the community forum stayed for the diverse community. And this time, we wanted to combine them both and, and try to eliminate any confusion for the attendees. So I, you know, I think we should go back to the point that Bob made and really try and think about, is this an opportunity both to provide information as well as to get input, and then figure out what, what's a good model to do that, um, and be brought in who we invite to um, hear from. But I do think having the discussion and having an opportunity for um, uh, the folks who attend to talk to us and to talk in small groups is good, but also, you know, to Isabel's point, we need to be able to put information out there as well. So how, how do we structure to accomplish both? But it's it's immensely better than what we were getting, you know, six months ago when we were just focused on legislators. So this is this is we're moving in the right direction. Um, followed by the community meeting that starts with 15 minutes of, hey, these are some issues that are out there that maybe we can help you to understand. Because all of those things are really great for a lot of the future. So um, I, in, in order to the idea of thinking really clearly about what the um, structure is, what we're expecting, and so forth, because I've been to three of these, including Tacoma, and they were quite different. Um, feels, looks, and so forth. And that partly depends on who shows up, but it also, the, um, I think the structure makes a difference. And the other thing I was going to add is that it's important that we think about what the follow-up is. If there are questions and people are promised information that they actually get it and there is an actual way of, of providing that, I'm not sure how, through a card or something like that. Um, because if, if the promise is made and they're not fulfilled, that's worse, actually. Um, and the other is that really it's an opportunity to and uh, make a connection with either a school or an organization which can be followed up saying, can we come to your organization, something like that. Um, and I, I know that happens with some of the schools, I think also through some of the organizations, and then I'm hoping that we will all commit to being at least available in some way to reach out. I don't think it has to be a full board, but um, it, it, it's a, this is, we're in a much better place than we were, but we're not totally there. And I think we can
concern was that, in fact, the folks would not get an opportunity to really present their concern. Um, the opportunity, actually, by the time we were done, they said we got much more time to talk than we, we thought we would. It wasn't two minutes or three minutes like the public comment. Um, I hope we can remain very open and flexible, and I would caution us not to start don't know what it is, but um, to a, keep building that broader audience. Um, I will say this, it is absolutely an opportunity for organized um, activists to come and talk. And we need to keep that in mind that yes, that is a concern in their message, but it may not be as pervasive as it sounds.
having been heard is something that is translated into something substantive, <coughs> something captured. And uh, we've had some discussion here about the mechanics of the meaning itself. But I think what's really important when we get to that discussion is how do we kind of capture what was said? How do we make that visible to a broader community? And most importantly, how do we kind of make a demonstration that as part of our listening, we're actually capturing some of that in what we say and do with this council? said otherwise, you know, when you get in a very ephemeral kind of approach to business, and I think what will attract people is if they get the belief that coming to those meetings actually has the potential of translating into action. And I think we need to look at it from that standpoint, because generally, I only go to council meetings or other meetings like that when I have some issue, and what I'm really looking for is somebody to say something's going to be done not be immediate, may not even be what I want, but what I'm looking for is that it was translated into something substantive. And uh, I'm just saying, I'm hearing a lot of good things. I think you know, these are obviously been taken to heart, but when we talk about the mechanics and the structure of the meeting, I think we have to spend equal attention to what we do with what comes out of that meeting. I just had a very short comment. I
and then we'll be clear about what the follow-up is going to be, especially because we make some commitments because we don't want people to think that it was a check, a thing that we checked off our box when we heard from people, right? And then there was no follow-up in terms of our actions or how we give information back to them about how their input was used. Does that make sense? I don't know if it makes sense. Great. So I think that's it. I don't know if we have any other questions for Stephanie about any of the other items. Is that Janice? I just said one question as a new member interpreting that dashboard. So I understand the sense of progress, but what I don't understand is how related the progress is to expectation. And if I can read that in the chart. So in the strategic plan dashboard, each of these items contains, like the achievement and opportunity gap, it contains a handful of smaller sub-goals, and they each have deadlines, and they're all listed in the strategic plan. So it might have like an annual deadline or an August 2016 timeline or something like that. So if it's annual, it won't be at 100% until the end of the strategic plan period, 2018. If it's August 2016 or something like that, then the plan is to conclude before, you know, conclude on August 6, 2016. Does that help to answer the question? Because it makes the tool itself a little less helpful because it's so relative to each item. And you might want to think about kind of that green, yellow, red strategy, and I don't want to make more work for you, but in terms of making it communicate the status of the work, it might be helpful. And because the strategic plan is so complex, I'm looking at different tools that can really give an in-depth view of how we're doing on each individual section. Some of those tools are, you know, like Results Washington has this amazing tool that we couldn't have. But it does a really good job of showing, like, how each item is doing. So that is certainly something that I'd like to 